it all changed after my first bomb hit. <laughs> Uh, one thing I should mention, <laughs> illustrations by Brian McGuigan also. Um, that's a bomb. <laughs> so, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I took, I took a poll up here. And I feel like I want to do this again. So, when I drew this plate, this paper plate, uh, Jamie, my wife saw it and she said, Is that supposed to be a bomb? And I said, Yeah, yeah, it's a bomb. Look at the ground on the bottom, there's smoke coming out of it. And she said, That doesn't look like a bomb. That looks like a ball sack. I said, What do you mean a ball sack? Ball sacks don't smoke. There's, you know, I've never seen smoke in ball sack before. Mine certainly has never smoked. And, and she said, um, No, it's a ball sack. So, just curious. You could clap if you think that's a bomb. <laughs> so one clap, thank you. Someone here is a stoner, thank you. You see my genius. Uh, if you think it's a smoky ball sack. <laughs> so glad my wife is not here. This would be yet another thing she would hold over my head. Well, it's a bomb. Move the G to the left. <laughs> oh, I think I see what you're saying. That's weird. <laughs> well, this is not called my first smoky ball sack. It's called my first bomb hit. I took my first bomb hit a few days after moving into the dorms at Chapman University, a small liberal arts college in Orange County, California, Best known then as the place where the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie was filmed. <laughs> <laughs> the administration used it almost as a claim to fame for the national orientation units. I didn't choose Chapman because of Rocky or Bullwinkle, but because the school was almost 70% women, and I assumed studying at a college in California would be like a never-ending episode of Beverly Hills 90210. <laughs> would be full of drinking, drugs, and slutty girls. I would go to class during the day and party and fuck all night, and since the school was 3,000 miles away from where I lived, nobody would know me as Chunk, Bulldozer, or Private Pie. I could just be Brian. My first day on campus, I met Mike Tanette, who was basically a black version of Manny Ramirez. Bleach blonde braids and all. Mike, like most Californians I knew, was a major pothead. <coughs> and a few days later, after he had asked everyone in the dorm if they smoked weed, and if they said yes, he said, where can I get some at? <laughs> he and I ended up at some guy's apartment, smoking out of a bomb. <laughs> By 17, I had smoked weed many times, but never hit a bong before. And on my first hit, I committed the mortal sin of bong toking. I coughed directly into it while inhaling. <laughs> Blowing water up the stem, through the bowl, and all over the couch. <laughs> the guy was cool about it, only after giving me a bunch of shit for fucking up his house. But I felt, felt terrible. And once the weed took hold, completely paranoid. So I did what most stoners do when they get completely paranoid. I smoked more. <laughs> Mike and I split an eighth, and we killed the whole bag that day, starting at the guy's apartment, and then finished it by puffing a huge blunt on the five. Or the smoke lane, as Mike called it. <laughs> Because in true California fashion, he was convinced that you could smoke weed freely in the HOV lane because the cops were just happy you were carpooling. <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, the munchies kicked in, which coupled with my increasing paranoia over, over the stupidity with the bomb made me want to eat and eat and eat. Since I had never been to Jack in the Box, Mike insisted we hit the drive-thru. Unsure of what to order, I shop for the moon. A Jumbo Jack, a Bacon Ultimate Cheeseburger, a Sourdough Jack, 
a chicken sandwich, Ooh. large curly fries, yeah. and a chocolate shake. Oh. <laughs> this meal is 3,967 calories. That's all? <laughs> that is all. <laughs> 3,967 calories, according to the Build a Meal feature on jackinthebox.com. <laughs> About two days worth of meals if you eat a 2,000 calorie diet. And I ate it like a snack. <laughs> My first of many binging episodes in the state of California. This wasn't the first binge of my life, though. I started young. The two pints of haagen after dinner when the middle school bullying was at its worst. The quarts of fried rice I ate and then puked when the other boys on my block teased me for being a bastard. The candy balls I inhaled that Halloween when the woman down the street wouldn't give me a trick or treat because she said I was too fat for candy. Food was my therapy. When I was stressed, depressed, lonely, or even happy, I ate to recover, to cope, for company, and to celebrate. I have eaten more calories in one sitting than most people do in a couple of days. And the next day, I hated myself. Just another fat fuck. And so I starved, pounding water in an effort to flush my system and relieve the swelling in my stomach. After each of these binges, I didn't purge. I never had it in me to purposefully waste food. Though sometimes, when I was a child, I puked from pushing my stomach well beyond its capacity. And with each binge, I woke up with that same regret, retracing all that I consumed, counting dead soldiers, the torn wrappers, overturned boxes, and empty cartons, like an alcoholic the morning after a bender. And then I starved myself until I fulfilled my penance, usually around dinner time, when I did it all over again, because I hadn't eaten anything for the entire day, and I was hungry. Brian. If you have ever been so lonely, you've drank just to feel like you had company. If you have ever smoked weed and been incapable of cracking a smile, if you have ever freebased pharmaceuticals, caffeine pills, sleeping pills, any pill you could, suck in the charcoal burnt smoke through a hollowed out big pen. If you have ever smoked opium until you cough so hard your eyes bled tears. If you have ever done ecstasy for a week straight by yourself, listening to the M&M's The Marshall Mathers LP on repeat. If you have ever wanted to die but didn't have the strength to kill yourself. If you have ever wanted to break mirrors when you look into them. If you have ever wished it was you instead. If you have ever believed no one would come to your funeral. If you have never questioned your own mortality, then all of a sudden you have to, and all you want to do is die so you have the answers. If you have ever eaten so much you puked, and then starved yourself as retribution. If you have ever done meth because you thought it would improve your body image. If you have ever punched a wall to feel the layers of paint, mud, tape, and drywall crumble as your knuckles break through, simply to experience anything other than the sadness that sits inside of you, comfortable and cross-legged. Then you might understand how I felt when Brian, my roommate with the same name, died in a car accident on Easter Sunday while I was home on spring break. Brian was on a racing, Brian was a racing aficionado on a test run in his brand new souped out Honda Civic. It was raining, which rarely happens in Southern California, and on a sharp turn, he hit a slick patch of road, lost control of his car, and went sideways. The car tumbled off the road, crashed into a rock formation, flipped in the air, and landed on its roof in the middle of the road, 
before it was hit by another race car. Brian hung upside down in his Civic for an hour before paramedics arrived. Still breathing but unconscious, he was pulled from the car with the jaws of life and rushed to the hospital. Both of his arms and legs were broken. His pelvis was shattered and there was swelling in his skull. After several days with no brain activity, Brian's family removed him from life support and he passed away. 19 years old, closed casket. The importance of being regular. <laughs> After Brian died, I fell into a depression not even Dr. haagen could help me work through, despite how much I tried to eat myself out of it. But when you eat just, just about anything but fiber and do whatever drugs you can find, your body eventually rebels. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't get out of bed. I was constantly in pain. But worst of all was taking a shit. I'd wake up every morning determined this would be the day. I'd sit on the toilet, a pile of magazines at my feet, and wait. After about 20 minutes, I'd start pushing, grunting, sweating, snorting, hoping something would come. Sometimes it would be a couple of pellets. Other times, only a fart. A loud one that would echo throughout the bathroom and make the toilet water inches from my butthole ripple. <laughs> by tossing stones. <laughs> and occasionally, about every three days, I would take an actual shit, but it was rarely full and meaty and mostly loose and yellow or pale brown with the occasional splotch of blood, like the most disgusting waterfall imaginable. My shitting dry spell continued for months, and I began noticing other problems too. I had developed an increasing case of an acne on my back, thighs, stomach, ass, and ass, and discovered hard lumps on my armpits and in my groin that I poked, pressed, and popped with thumbtacks, violently squeezing out the pus and blood until the skin grew reddish purple swollen and inflamed. After getting stoned one day, I convinced myself I had cancer and decided to visit the student health center where the nurse told me what every doctor had told me for most of my life. Brian, you need to lose weight. I was 339 pounds. My blood pressure was so high, the nurse took it three times because she couldn't believe the numbers. She gave me a little blood pressure scorecard and insisted I come back every day to check it. She said the words, diabetes, heart attack, death. She told me, Brian, if you don't do something, you are going to die. The nurse then referred me to a doctor for the swollen lymph nodes, which she said were common in obese people, not the cancer I assumed I had, but I never scheduled an appointment. Instead, I went to the only doctor I knew I could go to stoned, WebMD, <laughs> where I learned, among other interesting facts about going number two, that the human body can hold up to 25 pounds worth of shit in the intestines. Yeah. Or the equivalent of a chubby basset. <laughs> She'd rather shit a dog? <laughs> Sounds terrible. Jamie. Before I met Jamie, almost everything I ate besides ice cream and cookies came in a box that said, just add water. The nutritional equivalent of sea monkeys. <laughs> Bread, rice, and pasta were always white. Vegetables came in a can or a frozen box and gave me horrendous gas, so I never ate them. 
unless they were covered in gravy, which came in a pouch that, again, you just added water to. I thought I was getting my vitamins because I drank Sunny Delight. <laughs> when Jamie and I got, to get, got together, my perception of food completely changed. No longer would I eat anything that ended with the suffix aromi. <laughs> Jamie introduced me to fresh vegetables and fruits, chicken that wasn't deep fried and handed to me through a small plexiglass window, and perhaps, most importantly, fiber. Before Jamie, pooping was not so easy. <laughs> That's how I knew I had someone special. <laughs> but it wasn't just the pooping. About six months into our relationship, Jamie confronted me about my weight. At first, I was pissed off. Who the fuck was she? Until she started crying, telling me how when she was a little girl, her father, exhausted from a crazy diet he was on, drove off the side of some country road and died in a ditch. Jamie told me this story and then said, I love you, Brian, and that's why I'm scared you were going to die. I didn't understand what Jamie saw in me. I was fat, I dressed like an extra in a 90s rap video. <laughs> Every time we had sex, sweat poured off of me, soaking her. I didn't leave a wet spot, I left a wet pool. But Jamie said she was comfortable around me, could tell me anything, and I always made her laugh. My fat kid defense mechanism turned into one of the few things a woman can find attractive in me. Seeing the tears in Jamie's eyes showed me that someone in this vast world of fried food, ice cream, and pizza cared about me, loved me. Jamie was the first girl to say, I love you, but when it's followed by, you are going to die, only made those words truer. I barely loved myself, but Jamie's love for me was so strong, she didn't want me to die, and she was willing to do what she could if I'd only try.